Hey everyone, I'm back again with another video. Uh, I've got a little bit of a project that I was keen to try out with a couple of old machines I had kicking around. It's called the Retro NAS project. I've put a link to it below. Uh, it looked quite interesting as it had quite a few little um, add-ons and components and things that I um, that appealed to me. Um, mainly being file sharing, Samba file sharing, SMB, um, Apple's uh, Apple Talk. Um, as well as a proxy server, um, an FTP server. Um, so it's got quite a few technologies uh, that I thought would be quite cool to check out and um, put on some old hardware I had kicking around. And speaking of hardware, the distribution that this runs off is Debian 11 specifically, and that's for all the install scripts um, and all the other um, requirements that go along with that, um, that install script. I think there's various components of the operating system. It's designed to run on a Raspberry Pi, but as I said, it can run on any um, hardware that runs that distribution of Linux. So speaking of hardware, I have a couple of these Gigabyte Brixes. These are the GB-BXI5-5200. And you can probably tell from that model name that these are 5th generation i5 devices. I really like these little machines because of their small footprint. They're very power efficient, they basically have uh, laptop CPUs in them. Um, MSATA internally, um, the taller one has space for a 2.5 inch hard drive which you'll see later. But yeah, they measure 11 centimeters by 12 uh, centimeters roughly, so really small footprint, um, it can fit really anywhere. But before we install the Linux distribution, these things have been sitting in a workshop getting dirty and dusty so I figured it might be best just to do some quick preventative maintenance because the failure rate we had on these things um, yeah was pretty high so we'll do a little bit of work they're um, they're really easy to get into there's four screws around the base there and the top of it just pops off I've already had this one sort of stripped down ready to take components but we got room for two DDR3 uh, modules here they use the low voltage variant and we've got an MSATA port here as well, as well as the Wi-Fi, which is actually very nice that it's an Intel uh, chipset here that we're using. I think it's an AC um, variant. I think it has perhaps Bluetooth. I think it's just an AC adapter. I don't think it's got Bluetooth, but yeah. To remove the uh, motherboard, at least from the uh, chassis, we've got two screws either side of the device, and we can... Uh, sort of pry out the uh, motherboard to get to the heatsink and fan um, for cleaning. It's not too hard to get the motherboard out of the chassis. Um, I usually mark the antennas with a black dot depending on which uh, wire uh, was connected where. So, I mean, they are color coded on the card, but it looks like this was in the reverse order. Um, on the back, we have the CMOS battery and the heatsink. Uh, it's a very small form factor packed motherboard. Um, probably explains why some of these died quite regularly although these older ones that we're using today seem to last a lot longer than the newer plastic ones power button there on the top left a lot of USB 3 ports which is quite nice as well makes installing media quite fast um, I'm just going to check out the voltage on the CMOS battery here and it seems to be good still um, I have a spare CR2032 kicking around there as well um, but thankfully we don't need that. Just a few screws uh, on the heatsink mechanism itself. We've got two that hold the fan in, uh, so that's nice and easy, and another three that hold the heatsink itself to the motherboard. Easy enough to remove and get in there and clean the old dried out 
rubbish thermal paste that these things come with. Uh, amazingly, this actually hadn't actually dried out, but um, yeah, it's always good to have a good refresh because yeah, these things are um, running 24-7 um, for a couple of years actually, so uh, they would run um, maintenance screens and things like that, so yeah, they're just like little nooks basically behind uh, TVs and such. Uh, so yeah, here's the copper heatsink, and you can see some of the thermal paste that remains. Easy enough to clean off with some alcohol. Um, yeah, really didn't take much work at all to get it cleaned off, so that was nice. Putting the machine uh, back together wasn't too hard except the Wi-Fi antennas were really annoying to get back on. Um, it's just kind of the way they're angled and in there so you've got to be kind of careful with these because you can bend over the little tabs and things that retain the uh, cables in but um, either way I managed to get them um, secured back on and I forgot which way around uh, you tilt the motherboard it turns out you do the headphone jack side first and it just drops in like so so really easy to reinstall and then of course you've got your two screws that hold the uh, motherboard down mainboard button back up it's now time for the fun part which is putting some components into the machine itself I have um, 16 gigabytes of memory here so two 8 gig uh, DDR3 uh, modules with the same speed I think 1600 megahertz and I've got a uh, cheap transcend 128 gigabyte M SATA uh, SSD which I'll be using as the boot drive for the operating system and then uh, for data I've just got a terabyte spinning disk uh, terabyte hard drive from Toshiba uh, I think this came out of an HP looking at that part number at the bottom um, but yeah that all fits into this tiny little package the machine itself, this is the two and a half inch drive compared to it, so it's not much bigger than the hard drive, so yeah. Either or, we'll um, get the components fitted into the chassis, which is nice and easy.
if everything's sandwiched into the uh, computer, of course you always forget which way around the uh, lid is supposed to go. It's now time to install the operating system to the um, primary boot drive, which is that uh, M.2, uh, sorry, MSATA. <laughs> it's not that advanced. Uh, but yeah, the install process went really easy and I'd also recommend uh, installing the SSH client as well because it made it a lot easier to configure the device um, from a shell um, or remote session via PuTTY. Um, I also set the machine to auto power on in the event of a power loss, so that's also quite nice just if, you're, if the machine gets unplugged or you lose power, it will automatically turn back on, which is quite nice, I like having that. But yeah, the install process, at least for this part, went pretty smooth. Um, I ran into some issues actually installing the script itself. So there was a few gotchas here which I've put links to in the description. But yeah, one of the first issues that I ran into was upon installing the Retro NAS software, which is a script that you can just directly download to your device or copy it over. It was using apt-get I think it was, um, but it was looking for source media from the CD-ROM drive uh, for the operating system. So I had to actually exclude that from a list of sources. I've put a link to that in the description, but that's this is what I ran over here on the right. Um, upon doing that and rebooting, I was able to carry on with the install process and install uh, the RetroNAS software. Uh, one of the other issues I ran into was setting a mount point for the secondary hard drive. I've put a link to that in the description as well. It took a wee bit of figuring out how to get that mapped to a location, which is in Windows terms essentially a shortcut to the drive. Um, but yeah, it allows you to carry on anyway and uh, specify your data location within the retro NAS installer scripts. Uh, just a hot tip, um, if you do change that location you have to rerun the installer and reinstall these services, but yeah, I installed SMB and FTP and a um, bunch of other protocols and things using this script and it appears to work really well actually, so I've got my modern machine here um, running Windows 10. I'm just using FileZilla as my FTP client and um, yeah, you can just transfer stuff to it. Um, and SMB is also enabled as well. Of course, um, it goes without saying, you've got to be careful if SMB um, or any of these protocols really, they're uh, full of security vulnerabilities and things like that. So yeah, um, just a yeah, friendly reminder. But yeah, it allows you to map um, ISOs, install drivers, copy games and things like that. The proxy server is set up here as well. You just put in the IP address of the retro NAS. Its default port is 8080. And um, yeah, it appears to work pretty good. I mean, as good as it can get with IE6 and the modern web of its HTML and CSS uh, bloat almost, if you want to call it. <laughs> uh, modern web. But um, yeah, it's good enough if you want to jump online, get some games or some Doom maps and, you know, just have a bit of fun really. So yeah, works really good on Windows as well. I did try it on uh, Windows 95 and a few other uh, operating systems. Um, but yeah, it's really nice having a good bridge between different um, operating systems. So not just Windows, but like uh, Mac OS um, or OS 9 and 8 and any of the ones that support Apple Talk uh, networking. It's really good being able to have that, that bridge between multiple systems. And I think this is where this particular system actually really shines as opposed to just having a SMB share. So, you know, the ability to cross talk across multiple different operating systems is really good because you can keep everything in one place. You don't have to, you know, jump and set up a different file share and jump around and things like that. You just go to one place, all your stuff is there, and you can transfer data and keep everything all together. So, here we are on the Power Mac that I set up a while ago. You just throw in the IP address of the uh, NAS box and log in, of course, with your password that you set up during the wizard. And yeah, it looks like it um, loads at like a BSD little icon there on, on the right under the Macintosh HD. Uh, but yeah, here's all the folders that I've got on here. I've got my apps that I use and put on my retro machines quite regularly. 
um, just you know direct X and a few benchmarking tools and things like that I'm missing some OS 9 stuff so we'll create a folder here called OS 9 apps and we can transfer stuff from this machine into it I really love the ability just to drag and drop stuff over to this um, because some of these apps I had a little bit of trouble I'm not gonna lie getting uh, installed or copied over to this machine so having something like this set up is gonna make it a lot easier in the future uh, to work with these systems but yeah the um, proxy server as well works uh, for OS 9 as well I'm using uh, classic Zilla as my web browser um, so we'll just throw in the port of course for that uh, I mean this machine is quite slow so you can see I've kind of jumped ahead in my footage here but you'll see just even scrolling around on this page it's uh, a bit chonky um, yeah it's kind of as I redraw there you can see it loading and we'll start scrolling down this is me trying to move the mouse smoothly um, not working out very well but look it's good enough as you see just a get a few basic things done like that so yeah it's there as an option and it's all built in and it's all self-contained so yeah we are sweet and set up ready to go final uh, resting place for the machines behind my dusty old printer and sitting on an old NAS box which is no longer uh, in use actually it's just a little two-bay job anyway so um, yeah, plug the power in. This, this is why I like having the auto start functionality just to auto power on the machine and get yourself logged in. Uh, that wraps this one up. I'd definitely check out the project. The link is in the description. It makes doing stuff like this really fun, really easy. Um, as I said, it's a little bit step above just having a normal SMB share or something set up from a Windows side of things because uh, you get not only get the proxy server but the FTP stuff and the ability to use Apple Talk and all these other protocols that you know really useful for other machines um, so yeah I'd really highly recommend just checking it out if you've got some old hardware kicking around grab it throw on the OS throw on the script um, throw an IP on it and boom you've got yourself uh, a pretty neat little uh, setup for multiple platforms Anyway, that wraps this one up and hope everyone enjoyed and just a quick look at the system and um, yeah, I'll catch you guys soon.